My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in New York. Today's video is on the subject of arrhythmias, and this video is entitled, What Exactly is an Arrhythmia? Now, the word arrhythmia comes from two Greek words. The first is a, which means absence or loss, and the second is rhythmos, which means rhythm. So, arrhythmia literally means absence or loss of rhythm. A cardiac arrhythmia therefore means loss of cardiac rhythm. The term, however, is used in medical practice as a description for a disturbance rather than absence of heart rhythm. In that sense, the term dysrhythmia is preferable because it does literally translate as a disturbance in normal heart rhythm, which is exactly what it is meant to describe. The heart is a pump and its role is to work as efficiently as possible to try and get oxygen-rich blood round to all the vital organs of the body. It works most efficiently by beating in a regular rhythm and at a certain speed. Any unsolicited disturbance of the rate or rhythm can be termed a dysrhythmia and result in the heart beating less efficiently, but only for the duration of the dysrhythmia. Sometimes the inefficiency may be so trivial or short-lived that the patient feels no symptoms at all. Sometimes the inefficiency can be so significant or sustained that the patient feels symptoms or can even be incapacitated. It is important that the term dysrhythmia is never enough as a complete diagnosis. Dysrhythmia is an umbrella term for any kind of electrical disturbance rather than a term which pinpoints the exact diagnosis. In terms of symptoms, the most common symptom of a dysrhythmia is heart palpitations. A heart palpitation is an awareness of the heart beating in a way that feels abnormal to the patient. This may feel as an unusually fast heartbeat or an unusually slow heartbeat or a skipping, banging, racing, or fluttering sensation in the chest. Again, it is very important to stress that not all dysrhythmias cause palpitations, and neither are all palpitations due to a dysrhythmia. Palpitations are a symptom that the patient experiences, and a dysrhythmia is a diagnosis usually made on an ECG recording of the heart. Depending on how inefficient the heart becomes during the dysrhythmia, other symptoms may also become manifest. These include breathlessness, chest pain, dizziness, or even blackouts. Of all the symptoms, the, the symptom that is most concerning is blackouts. The diagnosis of a dysrhythmia is made by recording an ECG during the dysrhythmia. As dysrhythmias are often paroxysmal, meaning that they come and go off their own accord, an ECG done in, in the absence of the dysrhythmia may be normal and therefore mislead the patient into thinking that there is no dysrhythmia present. This is why the most reliable way to diagnose a dysrhythmia is to do an ECG during the symptoms. In those patients who are asymptomatic, the only way to pick up a dysrhythmia is to do prolonged and continuous ECG monitoring. Perhaps the most useful monitor in this regard is a reveal device, which is a small device which can be easily inserted underneath the skin and can monitor the heart rhythm for any heart rhythm disturbances for up to two years. Definitive treatment of a dysrhythmia is only possible after it has been caught on an ECG. The good news is that catching it on an ECG will allow the doctor to characterize it further and then give it a name. This is very important because different heart rhythm disturbances can disturb the heart efficiency in different ways and therefore pose different risks to the patient. In particular, sustained dysrhythmias, which go on persistently for minutes or several hours, are more likely to cause symptoms or even harm compared to transient dysrhythmias. Secondly, dysrhythmias which are accompanied by the heart going excessively fast or excessively slow are again more likely to be more serious than dysrhythmias in which the heart rate is not affected significantly. Finally, dysrhythmias which originate in the ventricles of the heart are more likely to be more inefficient 
and thereby more dangerous than those that arise from the atria or from above the ventricles. The reason is this, that if the dysrhythmia is born in the ventricle, then it's going to be born in one or the other ventricle. So it's either going to be born in the left ventricle or the right ventricle. And of course, where it is born is where it will activate the ventricle first. So that bit will contract first. So if you have a dysrhythmia which is born in the left ventricle, for example, the left ventricle will contract before the right ventricle. And this is why you get dyssynchrony with a ventricular dysrhythmia, meaning that the ventricles are not contracting together, they're not contracting in synchrony, and therefore you get a less efficient output of blood. There are two other important points to note. Dysrhythmias are more likely in patients who are older and sicker, with a larger burden of comorbidities, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, and vascular disease. Dysrhythmias are also more likely to be less benign in such patients compared to patients who are young and otherwise completely well. The second point is that if the heart is damaged for some reason, then it is already inefficient and irritable. Therefore, damaged hearts are more likely to be prone to dysrhythmias and are likely to tolerate sustained dysrhythmias poorly. And this is why everyone with a sustained dysrhythmia should have an echocardiogram and ideally some evaluation of the heart arteries which supply blood to the heart. If we know that the heart is a pump, is a strong pump, and the blood supply to the pump at times of stress is good, then the heart will cope with even very fast heart rhythm disturbances. The patient may still feel unwell with the dysrhythmia, but the heart will cope well enough to give the patient enough time to go to a hospital and get it treated. And most dysrhythmias, once identified, are easily treatable. The most important thing for the patient is firstly to try and maintain as healthy a lifestyle as possible, and secondly, be proactive in asking for medical help in terms of ECG monitoring, if the symptoms ever do manifest. With regards to ECG monitoring, it is important that the period of monitoring is long enough to capture the symptoms. Unfortunately, most healthcare professionals, healthcare institutions, have this knee-jerk reaction of organizing a 24-hour halter monitor. So the poor patient is waiting for several weeks, months, because they're getting these palpitations and then they get this appointment for a 24-hour monitor. And unfortunately, more often than not, the 24-hour monitoring period proves to be an inadequate enough time to capture the symptoms and therefore becomes a bit of a waste of time for the patient and the doctor. It is therefore very important for the patient to stress to the doctor that they need a longer period of monitoring. And that is decided by how frequently the symptoms occur. So I hope you found this useful. I am, as always, so, so, so grateful uh, for all of you who uh, take your time to watch me, listen to what I have to say, and put up with all my inconsistencies when it comes to posting videos. I will try and post more regularly. Have a wonderful evening. All the best.